Today we'll discuss the blessing that we bless every morning. Haroka haoretz al hamayim. That Hashem spread out the earth over the water. <clears throat> now everybody knows that dirt usually sinks in water. Dirt is heavier than water. It sinks down in water. <clears throat> but Hashem made this uh, sort of against nature that the earth, he built up the earth so it didn't sink under the water. The water, I think water is a, a, well, no, a very great percentage of the world is water. Um, at first glance, it should be that the earth should somehow or other sink down into the water if everything already is under the water. But God made it that it wasn't that way. <clears throat> In fact, what did God make? A very interesting thing that he made, he made a world and he wants the world to have people on it. People can't live underwater. More people have to live on top of the water. They have to live <clears throat> somehow or other separate from their in, uh, habitat. Fish live within the water. Uh, all sorts of other creations live within the water, but God didn't want man to live within the water. He wanted man to live outside of the water. So he made a special kindness, a special great kindness, and then he made a, if you want to call it a miracle, that the earth did not sink down under the water, but rather the water, the earth rose up above the water and made dry land. <clears throat> this is more or less what happened on the third day of creation. It said that God made dry land, he made grasses, etc. on the, gr on the dry, gr dry land. But the idea is that he wanted man to live on the dry land. <clears throat> this spiritually is a very big miracle if we just think about what's happening. Because <clears throat> according to the spiritual worlds, the, um, the water represents <clears throat> all these words that we can't see. Like fish live within the water. So it says correspondingly that something like the angels live within the heavens, they live within their, their, they're included within their habitat. They're one within their environment, which is not the case man. Man lives above the ground. When, uh, after a person 120 years old, he dies, then he goes into the ground. But a person lives above the ground. So his, his, the essence of man is that he is separate from his, um, from his environment. And even though we live from the ground, it's true, we live from the ground. But the, the our nourishment comes from the ground, but our the, our the the essence of man is that he's separate from the ground. He tills the ground, he works on the ground, and he gets his life sustenance from things that grow from the ground. But unlike fish, that fish breathe the uh, the uh, they take take the oxygen out of the water that they're in. They have to be in water, and if you take a fish out of water, he dies. But man is exactly the opposite. He has to be separate from his source. He has to be separate. <clears throat> and that's how God created man, that he wants man to have this feeling of separateness, of being separate. And that, in a way, is the essence of, of man. And one that's one of the many, many meanings of that man was created in the image of God. But Salam Elohim, that just as God is one, so man has to have this feeling also that he's one. And just as God feels that he's alone, and he reshown on the acharon, is also every human being has this feeling inside that really everything depends on me. It's called the uh, egotism. And it's a gift from God. God wants a person to feel this way. He wants a person to feel separately. But there's something even deeper that's going on here. And one of the <clears throat> necessary steps in the birth of the Jewish people <clears throat> was the splitting of the Yam Suf. They call it the Red Sea. It's really the Reed Sea. Suf means reeds. So, the Jewish people leaving Egypt, that was really the birth of the Jewish people. When the Jewish people were in Egypt, it was sort of like a fish in the sea, sort of like a fetus in the womb. Because when they were in Egypt, they had no real separate identity. They were totally dependent on the Egyptians. 
And the Egyptians fed them and they told them what to do. They gave them the framework. Their life depended on the Egyptians. And um, even though it was very difficult and they made the Jews suffer, but a lot of the Jews didn't want to leave Egypt. According to uh, most opinions, the minimum of Jew, amount of Jews that wanted, I'm sorry, the maximum amount that wanted to leave was one-fifth. There's some opinions that it's one-fiftieth and some people one-five-hundredth of the Jews that they actually wanted to leave Egypt. And the reason was is because to be in a fetal situation, embryonic situation, to be like a fish, uh, you haven't got any responsibility. You're just living from your environment and you're one with the environment and you're nothing separate. There's no free will. But when the Jews got out of Egypt, so one of the necessary steps was is that the, they had to go across the Yam Suf, that the Yam, the river, the sea, tr transformed to dry land. <clears throat> uh, interestingly enough, we talked about this before, that when God split the sea for the Jews, when they went out of Egypt, and he revealed the land in the water, Roka Ha'oretz, Alamayim, when he revealed the earth <clears throat> separate from the water. So in the Torah, it says, that Vayibaku Hamayim. It doesn't say that God split the sea. It said He split the water, and Rashi explains all of the water in the world, and it means all the water, not just in the physical world, but also the spiritual world, because the worlds are called also water. Shamayim, Shamayim. The main element of Shamayim is Mayim. Shin is, stands for fire. Asian Mayim. It says the heavens are mostly water. Why are they water? Like I said before, that the angels are included within the water, something like fish are within the sea. In fact, the sea in this world is the, I want to call it the, the replica of the heavens above. And when God took the Jews out of Egypt, he split the sea. What does it mean? That he split all the physical, all the spiritual worlds. What, do, what happens when all the spiritual worlds are split? As you can see, the creator of the spiritual worlds, which is God. And that's why it says in the, if you look in the song of the sea, the Shir, ha, shir, uh, shir ha, Al Hayam, as the Jewish people said, this is God. <clears throat> and it says, even the children, even it says, even the, the, the fetuses, even the fetuses in their mother's stomachs, they said, this is God. God was revealed. When was God revealed? When all of the sea split, when the water split, when the earth was revealed through the sea, then suddenly God was revealed. Why was God revealed then? Because when God took the Jews out of Egypt, <clears throat> as he wanted to prepare the Jews for the receiving of the Torah, which was going to be 50 days after, and one of the main preparations was to let the Jews know that the physical world, this physical world, which is represented by the earth, is more important and holier and more alive and more precious than all of the heavens that there are, the highest levels of heavens. And this here in this physical world, this is where God was going to give the Torah, here in this physical world. Says Vayered Hashem al Har Sinai that God went down on Mount Sinai. It says uh, Targum Onkula says the Yidgale that Hashem revealed Himself where in the mountain in the mountain in the higher worlds in the heavens. It says all the angels are saying Aye Makom Kavoda. Where is the place of God? And the other angels are saying Malei Kala Oritz Kavoda that the whole earth is filled with God. Now, there's where is Hashem really, really revealed? Where is the essence of Hashem? Hashem's will, Hashem's pleasure, nachat ruach. Where does Hashem get his nachat ruach, his reach nechoa? Specifically from this physical world. Physical things, physical things that we do. <clears throat> In a very well known mimo, we just finished learning a, a well known discourse of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe that he. He wrote and it was to be given on Yud Shvat, and in fact he passed away on that day. <clears throat> so it, it's talking about King Solomon. It, it's an it's a discourse on the sentence that King Solomon said the day that he created the, the built the Beit Hamikdash, the, the, the holy temple. He said, "Bati Lagani, I have come back to my garden, 
And in there, in that discourse, he says that what Moses accomplished was that he made not just a holy temple in this world, but he made every single Jew into a holy temple. And the fact that we're in this physical world and that we have the ability to do the commandments, which are physical things, and to learn the actual physical Torah with our physical brains, as that splits all of the water, that's the splitting of all of the spiritual worlds to see the creator of the spiritual. It's true we don't feel this, or at least I don't feel it when we do it, but we can believe that it's true and we can understand a little bit that it's true. And a little bit also you can feel. That's called simcha shel mitzvah. The happiness of the commandment comes specifically from this physical world. And that's the uniqueness of Judaism. Only Judaism has commandments. The other religions have rituals. They have uh, their heritage. They have customs. But they don't have what's called commandments. Commandments are actions given by the creator of the universe to the entire Jewish people. Millions of people saw, millions of people felt, millions of people heard on Mount Sinai, God appearing, God's word, the, the feeling of God. It says their souls jumped out of their bodies because what did God want to be revealed in this physical world? And that's the real deep meaning of Roka Ha'oretz Alamayim, that God made the earth higher and revealed above the heavens. The water refers to the heavens. So the physical is really higher than the spiritual. That's what it means that the that the, the, the earth is higher than the water. And this can be illustrated in, in, in a lot of ways. There's a very famous story that's told about the first Lubavitch of Hust, uh, Rebbe of Chabad. And his name was Rabbi Shneur Zalman. He was the one that wrote the book, the Tanya. And the story is, and the Lubavitch Rebbe, the, 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 sixth, the seventh Lubavitch Rebbe told this story several times, but it's a known story that once in the prayers of Yom Kippur, in, in, in Judaism, the highest day of the year, spiritual, the highest spiritual day of the year, is Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. That's the day that the holiest person in the world, the which is called the Kohen Gadol, the grand priest, were going to the holiest place in the world, which was the Holy of Holies in the temple, which is forbidden to go into any other day of the year, and for any other person in the year, except for this holy person. And it's on the holiest day of the year, so the holiest time and the holiest place and the holiest person they were all united together on uh, on this day of, of Yom Kippur. And nowadays, we don't have the temple, but like I said, every Jew is a holy temple. And the time that the holy, the high priest goes in, which each one of us has the high priest inside of us, which is called our godly soul. And that goes into the holy of holies, that you feel the holiest of the holy, the essence of God, as that is on uh, Yom Kippur. So the first Rebbe of Chabad, whose name was Rabbi Schneer Zalman, he was as close to the counterpart uh, of the high priest as you can get in this, in our times, for sure. <clears throat> and uh, it was Yom Kippur, the highest day of the year, and he was praying in the highest prayer of the year, in the Ne'ilah prayer, highest prayer, fifth prayer of the day which that they say corresponds to the fifth and the highest level of the soul. And suddenly in the middle of the prayers, he stopped and he uh, took off his tallit, his prayer shawl, and he left the shawl, which was very unusual. And some of his pupils followed him and they saw him go into the woods. They thought maybe he was going to, to meditate, to think. He went to an old hut. He went inside and he came out with a hatchet, with an ax. And he started chopping wood. The pupils realized that he wanted to do it himself for some reason because he could have told them to come along if he wanted to. He didn't have to do it on his own. And he chopped wood and he brought the wood into the house. And a couple of minutes later, they saw a fire burning. They saw this, the, the chimney, smoke coming out of the chimney. <clears throat> and he delayed there for a while. Now, all these things are essentially forbidden to do 
on Yom Kippur, unless it's saving a person's life. It's if a person, saving a person's life is different. Then you're allowed to, to do all of these uh, acts of chopping wood and making a fire. And they asked him afterwards what, 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 what happened. And he said that there was a woman that had just given birth and she was alone in the house where her husband was, I don't know. What well, didn't say in the story, but she had given birth and uh, she was so weak that she couldn't move and it was cold and um, she had nobody to take care of her. And he felt this, somehow or other he felt this. They say a Rebbe feels every Jew in the world, especially the pain of every Jew in the world, if that's possible, if that's what they say is true. I can't imagine how it's true. But this Rebbe felt every Jew in the world, and he felt this woman's pain, and he went, and he personally went, and he chopped wood for her and uh, saved her. Now, you can ask a question. He could have told his, his pupils to do it. He could have said, I mean, he was such a holy person. He was in the Holy of Holies. He was in the highest, most spiritual state that a human being can be. Why did he chop wood? So the answer is, is because roka ha'oretz alamayim, that the physical is higher than the spiritual. True, there can't be anything higher spiritually than the day of Yom Kippur. And not only that, you have to remember that the Rebbe was doing his prayers. He was a general person. He was praying for all the Jewish people. It's like the same thing as the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. He would unite all the Jewish people with the creator of the universe. He was like the example of what a human being is. And he would go into the Holy of Holies to show God that there's hope for the human race, hope for the Jewish people, <clears throat> no matter what sins that they've done. And so the whole the the first Rebbe of Chabad, when he was praying, it was a very, very high thing, very holy for all the Jewish people. But nevertheless, he left everything to help <coughs> one sick woman. And the, I, the reason of it is, is not because it's any sort of a spiritual uh, computation or calculation or you'll get a higher level of heaven because you help somebody than if you pray for yourself because he wasn't just praying for himself he was praying for everybody but the idea is that the physical is infinitely higher if you want to call it that than the spiritual in fact that's the whole essence in spiritual there's what we call higher and lower and in the physical there's no such thing as higher and lower it just reaches the essence of the creator because that's what the creator wanted when he made all these spiritual worlds was this physical world and that's the miracle of of judaism to show that the physical is higher than the spiritual it's higher than any calculations or computations that a person might make if i do this then i'm going to go to heaven and maybe i'll get a higher level of heaven if i sit and i learn more or maybe not to throw away all the logic and all the reason and just understand that sometimes the physical do a physical thing a physical favor for another person is higher than any spiritual level that i can attain and it could be that i'll lose all of my spirituality in order to do with this physical thing where did we get this strange idea from where, where did this come from this came from the first jew the original the originator of judaism that he discovered this amazing principle and that is abraham to do what God wants in this physical world, even if it's the most abhorrent thing for a human being to do. God forbid a person to take his own son and to kill him, but he knew that that's what God wanted. Why did God want it? He wanted to test him. He wanted to see that Abraham really believed that the physical was more important than the spiritual. If he would have killed Yitzhak, his, his son, it could be that he would lose his world to come. You can't kill people, even if God tells you to. You can't just kill your own son for no reason. But Abraham had everything to lose, everything to lose spiritually and everything to lose physically. But to do one act for God in this world, what the creator really wants you to do without any other calculations, not spiritual calculations, not personal, not any sort of business deals that you're making with God. This is totally unique. And this is the essence of what Judaism is. That's why the story of Abraham is in every single Siddur. That's what we're learning now about the blessings. So that we can maybe possibly, we can possibly say that this blessing is the most important blessing of all. Rokala or Atalamayim 
is showing the importance, the essence, the uniqueness of what the Jewish people are and the message that the Jewish people are here to bring to the world. That's why Abraham was called the father of all nations, Av Hamon Goyim. Because we have to bring this message to the world that a human being, when he comes into interaction with the world, only here can you find true meaning. Only here can there be true happiness. Only here is the responsibility. Only here in this physical world, Allah Oritz, the physical world, is a man different from an animal, different from an angel. The, the angels, to a certain degree, are called animals, Chayot HaKodesh, because they don't really have free will like a human being does. Here in this physical world, and this is a message not just for the Jewish people, it's for all humanity. The meaning is only found in this physical world. When a man comes in interaction with this physical world according to values, to manifest these values in the world is, if you want to call it, three things. It's not this idea of I and thou that there's only two things. This is, this is a very big mistake. The essence of what man is, is when man meets with a job in the physical world and he does it according to values, according to, if you want to call it his conscience, his feeling of meaning. And this creates a new thing which is above time, it's above spirituality, it's above any personal, if you want to call it the... Uh, profit or achievement if you want to call it in, in essence this is the essence of what a human being is and not what he can make for himself to make himself bigger in a way what we're calling what, we're, what we say in Judaism is that it's making God big yitkadal yitkadash rabba. to making God's name great can only be done in this physical world we'll call it, and that's what God did when he spread the earth made the earth more than the heavens, that this physical world became more important. So one good deed that a person does in this world can change the whole world. And even more, it can be sometimes a person in the last moments of his life, this is what Professor Viktor Frankl says, the person in the last moments of his life, that interaction that he has, his attitude that he has toward the world, specifically toward the world, can be the most meaningful moment of his life. It's just something between him and God, something that's eternal, something that nothing can possibly erase. <clears throat> There's also an interesting story uh, in, the, in the Bible, which also stresses this very much, and that's the story of uh, uh, Aaron's two sons, Nadav and Avihu, the first day that the temple was open that Aaron, Moshe, they sanctified the temple, that was called the tabernacle, the Mishkan. And uh, Aaron's two sons rushed in, Nadav and Avihu. And uh, they rushed into the Holy of Holies. They so much wanted to be spiritual. And uh, because they rushed in improperly, uh, they died. They died. And Moshe, Moses even said afterwards that these two people, they sanctified God's name. These people were close to God. They made God's name holy. They wanted to come close to God. It's wonderful. But they, it's a wonderful desire that they had, but they missed the point. Who got the point? Well, there's a story that happened later on in the time of uh, <clears throat> after the Second Temple was destroyed. How long after was this? This is almost a thousand years later. A thousand years later. And it said that the Rabbi Akiva and three other great um, uh, Talmudic scholars, uh, Tanaim, and Ben Azai, and Ben Zoma, and uh, ben Elisha Ben Avua, it says that they went into Parbeis. They went into the secrets of the Torah, and that three of them had terrible results. One of them died, one of them became an apostate, one of them went crazy. They said, Rabbi Akiva, he went in in peace and he came out in peace. The Lubavitcher Rebbe explains that all of these four men had tremendously spiritual uh, developed souls. And in, in addition to being amazing geniuses and pure people, but all of them, when they went up into these upper worlds, <clears throat> they all were so enraptured in the spiritual that they misunderstood 
they misinterpreted what God really wants. They thought that the spiritual was the main thing. So they said, Mayim, Mayim. They thought the water, the water, the water, the spiritual was the main thing. One of them went crazy. One of them became an apostate. One of them died. It says, Rabbi Akiva, though, he went in in peace and he came out in peace. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe explains, the Rabbi Menachem Mendel, the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, he explained that why did Rabbi Akiva come out and go in in peace? Because he already had in his mind that he was going to come out in peace. In other words, the only reason that he went into these spiritual levels was only to bring out the lessons that he learned into the physical world. Because the physical world is the most important. And that's this blessing, Rokal HaOretz Alamayim, that every second that we are alive, every second that we are in this physical world, I once asked somebody, I remember uh, an old fellow, we were talking in, uh, in, in America, I met some fellow, a non-Jew, I said, how are you doing? He said, all the time that I'm on the ground and the ground is not on me, I'm happy. In a way, this is very, very nice, very clever, cute, but it's very, very true because we have to be on the earth. We have to be out separate and interact with the ground, with interact with the world around us, to be separate. We're not like fish inside of the sea or angels inside of the heavens. <clears throat> and that feeling that we have of separateness, when we use the separateness, when we use our ego for the truth, for true values, and we defy sometimes our own selfish nature, <clears throat> then that gives a meaning, a whole new meaning to what the physical world is about. We can bring out the true fact that that the earth is really higher than all of the heavens are. And that's what Rabbi Akiva learned. And that's what I hope the lesson that we learned. This is a lesson that we can take with us the uh, the whole day and, and the whole week and the whole month and every moment of our lives. That's the reason that God took us out of Egypt. It's a preparation for us now for Pesach, which is coming up soon. Took us out of Egypt in order to make this world a wonderful place, this world a holy place, that this world a meaningful place and a blessed place and a happy place because happiness can only come from this physical world. As far as I know, animals and things like that, they don't laugh. Maybe they do laughing hyenas, maybe donkeys. But I don't think it's really a laughing, like, since like a human being, they don't laugh at jokes. So let us all take this message <coughs> with, with us and, um, and realize the holiness and the amazingness of this physical world that Hashem made this big miracle that we can walk on the earth and as God said to Abraham, the, the, to, to Adam, the first man, that to, to conquer the world, that's the job of man, is to conquer the world for the creator of the world, to reveal the creator in the creation, specifically in this physical world, because in this physical world is where the Torah was given, in this physical world is where Mashiach will come, in this physical world is where the raising of the dead will be. And when we, the raising of the dead occurs, then all the souls which are in the highest levels of heaven, even Moshe and Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov, which it says their souls are in the world of levels of Atzilus, Atzilut, the highest levels, they'll leave all these spiritual levels and they'll come down into physical bodies in this world. And these physical bodies will be essentially a reflection of every single second that we used our bodies in this world for a godly purpose because those seconds were really above time we'll reveal what that means and then it says it says that they will wake up and be happy those who are sleeping in the dirt all the dead people will actually raise up it's a, a very strange idea but it's true it's one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith that we believe that in an end we'll see how really holy the physical world is, the physical body is, <clears throat> we'll see that God's true intention is in every minute that we're here interacting with the physical world. So God bless you all. If you have a good week, I hope there's some questions. Um, um, First of all, yes. thank you very much. And, My uh, pleasure. I want to mention that Silke, who is uh, also 
very big um, uh, follower of your stream. She uh, told me to tell you because there's, I guess, a problem with her microphone or something, but she can hear us. She had told me to tell you uh, that uh, she really enjoys the shirim and it helps her and by while praying and makes her prayer deeper. Thank you. And, and um, I want to add on this that today's the shir com come from me personally in a very perfect moment because about when you said that we have to live by the values and to uh, to participate with the world, with the val values we have. This is exactly where I was, where I'm holding now and I'm reflecting on. And this is, uh, this is very powerful very for powerful. me right now. Thank you that very idea, much. Right, that idea that I said, uh, it's, it's very, very prevalent in Hasidut, but especially that comes from uh, Professor Viktor Frankl. V Viktor Frankl is very, very, Amazing, amazing, positive and ingenious and human uh, outlook of the world. I think unusual, unique to any other of the psychiatries or philosophies or anything. He was also a professor in, 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 in philosophy also. And he has a book which is called, um, which is called Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning. Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning. If you can get it. I mean, maybe you could write, uh, I think he writes in, in Austrian or maybe in German. Is it almost the same thing, Austrian and German? Yes, yes, it's pretty yeah. similar. So he writes also, he knew a lot of languages, and he's got these books written in, um, in German. German was his main language, even though he was very proficient in English, but German was his main language. And this idea uh, also inspires me also tremendously. And especially because he puts it in a way that's uh, it's scientific, right? When it, when it's in the books of Hasidut, it's very beautiful and it's very uh, Jewish and it's very inspiring. But Viktor Frankl has some way to put it that it inspires even. He's a doctor, so it really ins he's really uh, trying to how do you say apply to sick people, to sick people. And I think each one of us is to a certain degree not a hundred percent healthy. You know, <laughs> I mean, I can apply that to, to myself anyway. And, you know, we, we, we look at the world in sort of a selfish way. And he brought this in a way that's, that's like a healing for people, a healing for people to understand that um, he doesn't use God. He, he's, he's very careful. And he says it over and over again, Viktor Frankl, that he's very careful not to be religious because he wants his system to apply or he wants people to realize that his system applies also to non-religious people. But nevertheless, somehow or other, God is always involved. But it has to be a God that's, what do you say, meaningful. It has to be genuine. It has to be genuine. It's very, very possible for a person to be religious and not to be genuine. You know, he does the, the, the rituals and people like a framework. And you have the framework of religion and you're also promised, you know, the afterlife. What's going to be? I mean, it's a little bit scary. You know, we're all going to die one day. And, you know, here I am. And all of a sudden, I'm not going to be. Or what's going to be? You know, to be or not to be? You know, to sleep, with chance to dream. Am I going to be here? Or am I not going to? What, what's going on? So all these religions come and they say, you know, believe in me and eat me and drink me and you'll be okay. You know, we go to heaven. We'll be together. And Judaism also sort of says that, you know. So you can take Judaism like a religion. You know, here it is. It's, you know. It's certain and it's sure, and, and then you can get afraid. Oh, I don't want to say anything bad because if I go against the religion, is I'm not going to have my place in heaven, and I'm not going to. So all this is very. It's okay. It's oh, it's it's nice, but it's selfish and it's not genuine. It, and in a way, it's not human. <laughs> it's not human. You're just you know like animals. They they go where the the best food food is. You know, businessmen they. They make the best investment. So, you know, religious people, they also want religious, uh, you know, investment and religious food and go to heaven. And, you know, who doesn't want to be basking in the rays of, you know, God? Of it? But being genuine is a whole different thing. G being genuine means not thinking about what am I going to get in the future. It's more what the future wants for me. I think I've told the story uh, many, too many times, but I'll tell you one more time. 
So Victor Frankl said that one day, on two different occasions, he was in Auschwitz. And he, uh, he had already developed his system before he was in Auschwitz. In fact, long before. He had went into Auschwitz with a, a whole manuscript, <clears throat> 40 pages of shorthand, which later came out in a book in the English. It's called The Doctor and the Soul. I don't, I don't remember what it's called <coughs> in German. But he, um, <clears throat> so on one day he met two people at different occasions, <coughs> and they both wanted to commit suicide. So he asked them, why do you want to commit suicide? Which on the face of things was a pretty foolish question because there was absolutely no reason to live. You know, it was cold and it was miserable and these people had lost everything. They were living in an ocean of death. You know, why not just jump in? You know, there's no reason to just, life was just a pain. But nevertheless, he asked them. So both of them said, I have nothing more to expect from life. Each one gave the same answer. They have nothing more to expect from life. So he said to both of them, maybe you're right. Maybe you don't have anything to expect from life, but maybe life has something to expect from you. Suddenly they realized, both of these people, they realized, you know, maybe that I have something to live for, someone to live for, someone to give to, someone, in other words, to be in this world, but with a value, with a purpose, with a reason. Not just the world itself will, will tell me something, but interaction, how I hold on to my values or how I realize new values, what my conscience tells me in these uh, sometimes difficult situations that a person then suddenly realized, <laughs> Victor Frankl said that if you ask him that the Holocaust strengthened as many people's <clears throat> religion as weakened it. He said, what is it like, like a fire in a strong wind? Straight fire in a strong wind. If, if it's a small fire, so a strong wind blows it out. But if it's a big fire, then the strong wind makes it bigger. So it's those people that went into Auschwitz and they had a positive attitude toward life. So the Holocaust only made this attitude stronger, that they had a positive attitude toward life in all situations. In other words, nothing in the world was going to make them negative, which meant they had to be strong strengthen themselves, deepen themselves more and more into themselves and think, I have to be positive, I have to be positive, I have to find something, something real to be positive about. But the people that were weak, they didn't have, so the, the fire blew it out, uh, the, the, water, I'm sorry, the, the wind blew it out, and of course it was a terrible wind, you, know, you can't blame anybody for it, it was a, uh, you know, no one, only Mashiach will be to ex able to explain what was the good of the Holocaust? You know? But but nevertheless, we can be assured that there was some good. And and after all, everything that God does is good, and God does everything. So how this figures out is just mind-boggling, impossible to understand. But the fact is, is the Mashiach, one of the things he'll do is he'll explain. And the Rebbe once said, and he's going to have a, have a lot of explaining, <laughs> a lot of explaining to do. But that's the point, that man's interaction with the world right now, but according to his values, according to his principles, his, if you want to call it his, his responsibility, you know, he feels responsible to the world, to himself, to his soul, to God, that that's what makes meaning. It's something that's above time. It's something that's above reason. It's above logic. It's pure life. It's pure good. It's, if you want to call it, it's pure love. It's something that's indescribable. And that's what every human being is. Every human being is indescribable, is indefinable. You can't define what a human being is. You just look in the eyes sometimes of children. And you can see something in, indescribable that you can't explain it. Once in a while you can get an artist that can catch it a little bit. You can get a, a musician that can bring this beauty out. Get a, this inspiration, right? And that also is not understandable. You know, that how it can be the the music of Chopin or the music of, of Brahms or the music of Beethoven, how it touches something inside of you. It's just, what does it touch? Who knows? It's just, uh, <laughs> you can't explain it. That's something. But nevertheless, what is it that does this is the physical world. Something in the physical world. That's Rokaha or it's Alamayim. The earth has something magic in it. The, the land, the physical world has something that's indescribably meaningful and beautiful and deep that is it's indescribable it's just pure human it's just if you want to call it godly and that's why we're here is only to to realize this but the jewish people added a different thing 
they added in absolute good, that the commandments are absolute good. It's a type of good that is the reason why God created all the other types of good. The reason why God created music and art and beauty and and the poetry and the, the, the source of all this beauty, believe it or not, is the commandments. Is the Torah, who would ever dream of such a thing? Is the, the mitzvahs, the commandments, and the, the wisdom of the Torah. <clears throat> this is fantastic. And this is given to the Jews. That's why we're blessing every morning and we're thanking God. We say, Baruch Atah Hashem. We're blessing and drawing down the revelation of Hashem in this world by means of our deeds and our actions and our words and our thoughts and our attitude. All right, my friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. We have to, uh, maybe I'll come back to Germany sometime. We'll you maybe. should. <laughs> that was a very successful Shabbat that we made there. In yes. And maybe, maybe ask Rabbi Teichel again to uh, Rabbi Segel to invite me again. I'll be very happy to come. Good. Any more Great. questions? Um. Thanks a lot. No, Anybody else? So there, there was one. There was one person that wrote to me. I gave him an answer back. Hey, you have my email address. Thank you very much. God bless you all, and I'll see you all next Sunday. Hashem. All the best. Shalom.